Barakata Yahawa, Malakabala, Hagadaw al Hayam of our forefathers, Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaqua. We just come to you now, Abba Yah, at the beginning of your Shabbat day, your set apart holy day, Abba Yah, to give you praise, to learn more about you, Abba Yah, and to draw near, Abba Yah, asking that you bless us with your presence, Abba Yah, that you bless us with your Ruach HaKadosh to lead us in the study, Abba Yah, of your Torah of your Tanakh, of your brick Hadashah, that it cleanses us, Abba Yah, and shapes us into vessels of your will, that it brightens our light, Abba Yah, that shines on your majesty, your kingdom, to be an ensign, to be a beacon, Abba Yah, to your lost children to be a source of strength, Abba Yah, of your children that are waking up and are trying to walk in all your ways. We give you thanks, Abba Yah, to Rabbah Abba for hearing our prayers, answering our prayers, Abba Yah, giving us understanding, giving us shalom. And on this Shabbat, Night, Abba Yah, we just ask that you inspire Moray Samak, that he delivers your message the way you want it delivered, Abba Yah, and that it reaches its target. Give, give us soft hearts, Abba Yah, that we can receive. Give us strength and courage, Abba Yah, to put it to work in our lives and walk it out. That we exemplify, Abba Yah, your image and your likeness. Abba Yah, we just ask that you forgive our forefathers for their transgressions, their iniquities, Abba Yah, their lack of respect of the heritage that you blessed us with, Abba Yah. And hear our repentance when we turn, Abba Yah, from wickedness and ask for your forgiveness, please blot it out of your memory, Abba Yah. In all things, Abba Yah, we give you thanks. To da reba, Abba. Blessed are you, Yahweh. Blessed is your name, Yahweh, and blessed is he that comes in your name. Hello, Yah. Hallel, Yah. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah, praise Yah. Um, this time, give all praise, and honest to the Most High Yah for bringing us to another Shabbat, for watching over us and protecting us and keeping us as we are at this moment. And I'm sure everyone probably has some praise to give them tonight, but we try to do that at the end portion tonight, as uh, I have a lot of material that I would like to try to cover. Um, praise be to the Most High for the strong prayer by the Zakane, as he prayed that we get wisdom and knowledge from his Torah, his Tanakh, and his Brit Kadashah. So we do have quite a bit to try to cover tonight. Um, and may the Most High Ruach be with us and leading guide us on this night. We will be starting off uh, tonight with the book of 2 Kings, going back to our regular scheduled reading. Um, we'll be going to 2 Kings. Should we go on one? Second Kings uh, chapter 15 and 16, Kanakya, read them, uh, read both of them. Second Kings chapters 15 and 16 is where we'll be starting our study at tonight. Second Kings 15 and 16 is where we're going to start our reading. All right, Second Kings chapter 15. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah, the son of Amaziah, the king of Judah, to reign. 
16 years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned two and 50 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jecolia of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of Yah, according to all that his father Amaziah had done, save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still in the high places. And Yah smote the king so that he was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. And Jotham, the king's son, was over the house judging the people of the land. And the rest of the acts of Azariah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel, uh, the kings of Judah, excuse me. So Azariah slept with his fathers and they buried him with his fathers in the city of Dawid. And Jotham, his son, reigned in his stead. In the 38th year of Azariah, king of Judah, did Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reign over Israel and Samaria six months. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Shalom, the son of Jabesh, conspired against him and smote him before the people and slew him and reigned in his stead. And the rest of the acts of Zechariah, Behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. This was the word of Yah, which he spake unto Jehu, saying, Your sons shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. Shalom, the son of Jabesh, began to reign in the 39th year of Uziah, king of Judah. And he reigned a full month in Samaria. For Menahem, Menahem, the son of Gadi, went up from Tirzah and came to Samaria and smote Shalom, the son of Jabesh, in Samaria and slew him and reigned in his stead. And the rest of the acts of Shalom and his conspiracy which he made, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And Menahem smote Tifzah and all that were therein and the coast thereof from Tirzah. Because they opened not to him, therefore he smote it, and all the women therein that were with child he ripped up. In the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, began Menahem, the son of Gadi, to reign over Israel, and reigned ten years in Samaria. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah. He departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And Pul, king of Syria, came against the land. And Menahem gave Pool a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. And Menahem exacted the money of Israel, even of all the mighty men of wealth, every of each man fifty shekels of silver, to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. The rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Menahem slept with his fathers, and Pekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. In the 50th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekiah, reigned, the son of Menahem, began to reign over Israel and Samaria, and reigned two years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. But Pekah, the son of Ramalia, a captain of his, conspired against him and smote him in Samaria in the palace of the king's house with Argob and Aria, and with him 50 men of the Gileadites, and he killed him and reigned in his room. And the rest of the acts of Pekah, and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. In the 250th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Ramalia began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned 20 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. In the days of Pekah, the king of Israel, came Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, and took Ion and Abel Beth Maacah, and Genoa, and Kadesh, and Hazor, and Gilead. And Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and carried them captive to Assyria. 
And Hoshea, the son of Elah, made conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Ramalia, and smote him, and slew him and reigned in his stead in the 20th year of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. And the rest of the acts of Pekah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. And in the second year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, to reign. Five and twenty years old was he when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of Yah. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. He built the higher gate of the house of Yah. Now the rest of the acts of Jotham and all that he did. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In those days, Yah began to send against Judah, Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia. And Jotham slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Ahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. Second Kings chapter 16. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Ramali, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of Yah, his Elohim, like David his father. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his own son to pass through the fire, according to the abominations of the heathen, whom Yah cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on the hills, and on every green tree. Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. At that time, Rezin, king of Syria, recovered Elath to Syria, and drave the Yaldim from Elath, and the Syrians came to Elath, and dwelt there until this day. So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of Yah and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it for a present to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria hearkened unto him, but the king of Assyria went up against Damascus and took it and carried the people of it captive to Kir and slew Rezin. And King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet Tiglath Pilazar, king of Assyria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And King Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest, the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it, according to all the workmanship thereof. And Uriah, the priest built an altar according to all that King Ahaz had sent from Damascus. And Uriah, the priest, made it against King Ahaz, came from Damascus. And when the king was come from Damascus, the king saw the altar, and the king approached to the altar and offered their own. And he offered his burnt offering and his meat offering and poured his drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings upon the altar. And he brought also the brazen altar, which was before Yah from the forefront of the house, from between the altar and the house of Yah, and put it on the north side of the altar. And King Ahaz commanded Uriah the, the priest, saying, upon the great altar, burn the morning burnt offering and the evening meat offering and the king's burnt sacrifice and his meat offering, with the burnt offering of all the people of the land and their meat offering and their drink offerings, and sprinkle upon it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice, and the brazen altar shall be for me to inquire by. Thus did Uriah the priest, according to all that King Ahaz commanded. And King Ahaz cut off the borders of the bases, and removed the laver from off them, and took down the sea from off the brazen oxen that were under it, and put it upon the pavement of stones. And the covert for the Sabbath that they had built in the house. And the king's entry without turned he from the house of Yah 
for the king of Assyria. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaz, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And Ahaz slept with his father and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in the stead. All right, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, Mr. Bakai, um, we're right in season with our topic still. So uh, one of the things that I want us to uh, focus on in these chapters and get right to some of these points is uh, we see that there was different kings. And as we've already established from all the readings from so many of the books of kings we've already read this for, there's either going to be righteous kings in Israel or Judah, or there's going to be either wicked ones. And then there's going to be those that are partially on the right path, but still are not fully walking completely in Yah, right? There's another term or phrase that I want to look at as being pleasing in the sight of Yah, how they did not do things pleasing in the sight of Yah, or they did do something pleasing in the sight of Yah. Just keep that in your mind's eye for uh, where we're going at this moment. So I'm starting off, um, and I want the Yaladim also to pay very close attention um, also to these ages uh, that you will hear of some of these young men when they became kings, which meant that children were actually going to be raised up in the word, raised up in the Torah to either obey or not to obey based upon their forefathers. But all the kiddiness and, you know, some of the childlike ways of today, what we would see is our forefathers, children matured quicker than what they were uh, maturing today. So let's go in and get some of this. So it says in the 20th and 7th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel began Azariah, son of Amaziah, king of Yehuda, to reign. Sixteen years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned two and fifty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jacola. So he was sixteen years old, meaning you don't just learn everything when you're sixteen. That meant there was already a time period where he was actually learning how to do certain things and being trained up as a child because a king, if, a, if you're of a line of kings, then you know that you are being prepared to be the next in line at some point whenever your father dies. So this is something they will be being instructed. However, we know that all the kings in Israel are supposed to actually govern their community, govern their uh, nation by the laws of the Most High. That's written within the Torah within itself, all right? That's one of the things that a king is supposed to do. It's supposed to write a copy of the Torah, supposed to teach the Torah to the people. There's a priest that's gonna be a counselor to the kings to make sure that the king is aligned with the will of the Most High. What we see here is that there's been a lot of kings that would either do right or not do right. But what I wanna first establish here is this young man was 16 years old when he began to reign. He was trained up and he was taught up. It says. He did that which was right in the sight of Yah, according to all that his father, uh, Amaziah, uh, Amaziah, had done. Save or accept that the high places were not removed, the people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places, and Yah smote the king so that he was a leper uh, until the day of his death. So one of the things that we're looking at here is this young man, when he became a king, is that he did right in the sight of Yah according to as his father Amatia had done. So he was one that was trying to walk someone in righteousness because of what he's seen his father do. He tried to follow some of that righteous path, but still he did not completely destroy the, uh, the idolatry or the, uh, the high places that Israel had already established in the land when it was offered to much idolatry. And that thing brought leprosy upon him because as king, you have an, a duty to do to establish the nation back in Yah. A king, when he's the king, if the king before me was wicked, when I become the king, I still have an opportunity to be the one that's going to be righteous. So because even though he was righteous to a degree, he still did not tear down the, uh, the uh, offering places or the high places. So therefore, the people still sacrifice and burn incense on, on these high places, on these groves and these altars that were for idols, all right? Dropping down um, in verse eight, it says, in the 38th year of Azariah, king of Yehuda, did Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reign over Israel in Samaria six months. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. So again, you know, I've been making a statement um, 
here as of recent that a lot of times people get caught up in what did my mother do? What did my father do? My grandmother, my great, great grandmother. This is what our family has been doing for generations. This is what my ancestors did. All of this type of behavior. And so anytime someone tries to correct someone in their way of worship or, or them thinking that they're actually following the creator, we are stuck in following what our ancestors or what our fathers, mothers, grandmothers have done before time. And if they are out of order, such as in the generation that we're in now, we have grown up in a custom that is anti-Yah. I'm not going to even say anti-Messiah. I'm going to say anti-Yah. There would not be a called Messiah if there was not a Yah first and foremost. So the society that we are in is anti-Yah as well as anti-Messiah. Why? Because what is being taught in the churches is not the word of Yah. The word of Yah is in the book, which is commonly called the Bible, but it's taught from a theologian perspective and it's taught with much idol worship laden within the doctrine that's being taught. So in the churches, they're having pork being eaten and served um, during their holidays. They're doing things such as Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, New Year's, all of this stuff, which is not actually of the Most High, right? So, and I know some may be newer than others, but what we're trying to do is what we have to understand is how did this idolatry slip into our people? How have we become such a people that does not know our father? Well, the proof is that all the way back to ancient times, it has always been so. That our forefathers would branch off and start following the other nations and the way they serve their gods. They were bringing it after generation and generation of them passing it down we grow up walking in something that we think is right, think that we're serving the most high when we're actually serving a false God. And once you become accustomed to doing things a certain way, it is very hard to let go of the custom or the tradition of your fathers and of your mothers. But what we see here is according to the word of the most high, it is letting you know that if we do not break that commonly call, as people like to use today, generational mindset is what I'm going to call it, which most people say generation of curse, it's the generational mindset of being in the mindset of the false doctrine of our forefathers instead of actually seeing that the Most High tells us that we should follow him. If we can read and comprehend what his word says, no matter how my father did it, my grandfather, great-great-grandfather and mother did it, if it is not according to this word, I have to repent and have to say, we have to do away with that way. And what we're seeing here is that the fact that parents were walking before their children in idolatry, the children still embrace the idolatry of the customs of the forefathers and their great, great, great grands, so on and so forth. And they kept bringing that in Israel, right? So we see the king has now changed to another king. And he said he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah. As his fathers had done, he departed not from the sins uh, of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, uh, who made Israel to sin. So um, what I want to focus on here is the word for sin. So you know we've been covering um, in our studies already, um, we've been covering the past couple of weeks about willful sin and sins of ignorance and how the Most High winks at us when we're in our ignorance. And it tells you in the Torah that there is actually um, a, a way that you are to offer to be forgiven of a sin of ignorance, once you have knowledge that you were doing something wrong, that's ignorance. The Most High Wink said that you make your offering and then you'll be forgiven of that. And then it's what's called presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin is something that you're willingly doing. And in the Torah, there's not actually written a way to be forgiven for presumptuous sin. As we covered in the book of uh, Hebrews, it said, once you have knowledge of sin, and you willfully walk in it, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. So it actually lines up with the Torah, where the Torah tells you how to be forgiven of sin, but the Torah does not actually tell you how to be forgiven of willful sin, because willful sin has never been acceptable in the sight of Yah. He did not even have anything written in the Torah in regards to willful sin. Only thing you see written in Torah for willful sin and it's the punishments for sin. Even when Israel did not know how to handle a situation, such as when the Shabbat was being um, broken, when the young man was picking up sticks, Moses said, hey, I don't know what to do. Let's inquire of Yah. Yah said, stone him, put him to death. Why? Because he knew better. 
So when it's ignorance, the most high is merciful, he's gracious and he's forgiven. But whenever it's willful, the most high did not leave us actually a scripture to tell us really how to be forgiven or atoned for that willful sin because we're not supposed to be willingly sinful, right? Now, I will say that our creator, the most high Yah's mercy does not do forever. So he is the judge. And so he can be forgiven to whom he want. But the way we must teach is what we can prove out of this word and not try to be walking in that false grace that we've walked in for so long that we can just continue to do what we want to do and God just gonna forgive us, all right? So the word for sin um, in Hebrew, um, one of the words for it is gonna be H2398, uh, H2398, which is kata, or kata, ah, kata. Sin is to miss, it's for, first of all, it's to sin, which means to miss, go wrong, guilt, forfeit okay so sin is to miss and one of the definitions is to miss the goal or path of right and duty all right so real quickly y'all hold one moment because some things that i just want to put on the screen for the sake of so everybody can see it for themselves give me one moment uh can y'all see my screen Somebody just unmute your mic and let me know. Okay, uh, scream is yeah. okay. All right. So we're right here in verse nine. So again, I just want to go to uh so we can see. So again, sin is H2398, which is kata. It says properly to miss, hence, figuratively or generally to sin, to forfeit, to lack, expiate, repent in some instances, lead astray, uh, bear the blame, um, to purge. So when we look at sin uh, from our uh, understanding, the one that we look at the majority of the time is to miss, to miss the mark, all right? So to miss the mark, all right. So with that being said, let's jump real quick, uh, Kanaka, to the book of Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and start at verse one. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to lean for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of Elohim, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of Elohim's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of Elohim. Okay, so hold it for a second. Um, it says, my brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to Elohim or to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And my brothers and sisters, that's the same thing that I hope for each and every one of us that we may be saved, right? So brother, my heart's desire and prayer to Elohim or God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of Elohim or God, but not according to knowledge. So what he's saying is uh, there's a lot of people that say they believe in God. There's a lot of people that say they serve God, they love God, and all these things. And you can tell they have that zeal. Like people really, they talk about God a lot. So they think. They, they think they really do worship him. They think a lot of what they're doing is actually serving him. But what we have to understand, according to this word, these words were being spoken to people during that time that were actually not actually serving God properly as they thought they were. So it says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of Elohim of God, but not according to knowledge. And in the book of Hosea, it said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So it says, for they being ignorant, which the most high winks at us in our ignorance, but we cannot always claim ignorance because the most high always sent his prophets or his messengers out to proclaim, uh, to proclaim his name, his word and his way, all right? So it said, for they being ignorant of Yah's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of Elohim. So what people have done at this particular time, times past, and even present time during our current day and age, is people, they, 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 they go to church all the time, and they bear record that, uh, uh, that they know God, when in all actuality, 
They don't. They're ignorant as to who he is and his righteousness. And it says, and they go about to establish their own righteousness. So they come up with their own way of doing services. They come up with their own way of worship. And they do all this stuff and they call it holiness. When sometimes what they're calling holiness or what's actually we translate as set apartness is not set apart at all to Yah, but it's set apart to the false one who from the very beginning caused Adam and Eve to miss the mark with his trickery. All right. It says, so they have established their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God or to the righteousness of Elohim. So, so many people have established their own way of worship that they would not submit themselves to the righteousness of Elohim, what his word actually says. So not only during the apostle Paul's time, even ancient times, going back to the king's time, which is more ancient than apostle Paul to us, going back to the kings, that's the same thing they did. They established their own righteousness, their own ways of worship. They followed the nations and the customs of the heathen, more which the Torah more. tells them. Uh, somebody might came on mute if you could, please uh, mute it for me. But I can't see my screen. We got uh, Yohanna. If you can see who Mike is coming, mute. Can you mute that for me? Okay. Let's do. Yeah, still going. She's gonna pull the screen up. Okay. Right. You, you want to give me? Yeah. 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 Let me give it to you, though. Let me get that because I can't. It's this this one that goes in the water. Click. Bon. Yes, sir. Exactly. If, you can, if you can handle that for me, hold on, hold on. All right, all right. Thank you. So it says, uh, so of course they established their own righteousness, but they did not submit to the righteousness of Elohim, and that's what goes on right now. Whenever we're trying to now tell people that the way that we've done things have been erroneous or we've done it in error, they get upset because this way we've always done it. That's the way we was raised. You was raised the same way grandma nam did a uh, granddad did and when we went to church pastor so-and-so said again this is not a knock to anyone or anyone's mother father grandmother this is just actually us having to see the reason why it's so hard for people to submit to because as we read already in kings they were doing the same things back then this is what this is how they worship so i'm going to worship the way they worship i'm not going to actually do what the torah tells me to do I'm going to worship the way my fathers have worshiped these false ones. And so therefore they've submitted themselves unto their own way of worship, still proclaiming the name of Yah with false worship. And so they do not submit to the righteousness of Elohim, which so many of us or our people today does not submit to the righteousness of Elohim. Verse four is going to be key. Give me verse four of the same chapter, Can I? Well, Mashiach is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. It says, for the Messiah is the, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Y'all bear with me one moment. Let me get it on the screen for us. Just want to prove all things. All right, so we're going here. Uh, so it says, for Mashiach, they have here in, uh, in the KJV of Christ, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So again, remember, as we've been going over, the only thing that was written during the time of Paul, the apostles, the disciples, and Messiah, that even after they passed until about 400 years after, the only thing that was written during their day and age was the Torah and Tanakh, the Old Testament. That's what they followed. That's what they read when they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, therefore to read. So whenever we are reading this word, we need to have a history, a historical understanding of what they believe to be the word of Elohim. Because when you read this from the church perspective of how they teach this verse right now today, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So what they would say to us is, we're putting ourselves back under bondage because we're trying to keep the law, statutes, and commandments. And Christ was the end of the law, it's over. Well, that word here, end, does not mean over or it's done. So we're gonna go to the word here for end, which is telos. In the Greek, telos, to set out for a definite point or goal, properly the point aimed at as a limit. That is uh, the conclusion. So it says, uh, properly to point the point aimed at as a limit, the goal. So basically, the Messiah is the goal that we're trying to reach. 
for Messiah is the, uh, is the goal of the Torah or the point that we're trying to reach. That's the example that we're trying to obtain for righteousness to everyone that believes. Not that he came and died for everybody to still be homosexual, for everybody to still be eating pork, for everybody to still be doing Christmas, for everybody to be doing the very same wicked nonsense that our forefathers was doing before he even walked the earth. He did not come to justify sin. He was righteous. And so he is, when you're looking at the, uh, what righteousness looks like, this is what it looks like. It looks like the Mashiach. He came to save his people from their sin by showing them how to walk righteous and not to be in idolatry and to return them back to the most high Yah. So again, why did I go here tonight? Is because we went into the word for sin. Sin means to miss or to miss the mark. So what is the mark? The mark is the goal or the point that we aim for. So in the instructions of the most high, he tells us what is righteousness. And he tells us, if he tells us not to make any idols and we have an idol in our home, or we make an idol ourselves. we have missed the mark because we're supposed to be trying to line up with his word. And if we're not lining up with his word, sin is to miss the mark of his word. We're not lined up with his word. So Messiah is the end or the goal of the Torah for righteousness to everyone that believes. So that's the point that we're supposed to be aiming for is to be like Messiah. And we all know Messiah kept the feast days. Messiah said, as his customs was, he went to the synagogue on a Sabbath day, therefore to read. So he kept Sabbath. He kept the feast days. He kept Hanukkah. He didn't eat any unclean meats because we know what he ate. He ate the fish and the breads and things uh, that we've read already in the Brit Kadashai, commonly called the New Testament. And he did not worship false gods, right? He came to direct everyone back to the Most High or to show us how to get ourselves in order so that we can return back to the favor of the Most High. Now going back to Kings. In verse, uh, so I'm going back to verse nine. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah, as his fathers had done. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of the bat who made Israel to sin. So stumbling blocks were cast by the forefathers because when they worshiped false gods, when they built these images and these idols, the children of their day and age wanted to continue doing what their fathers did. So therefore, forget what the word says. That ain't what it means. Uh, you can worship how you want to worship. All days are alike. Whatever the nonsense was in their day and age, like we have the nonsense in our day and age, if the Most High says, remember the Sabbath to keep it set apart, you can't just make any day set apart and claim it's okay. Yes, we can worship him every day. Yes, we're not going to argue that because we should worship him every day. But you can't use that blanket statement as a reason as to why you don't keep Sabbath. You can't say that you love God and keep walking around with an image of a fake so-called Jesus around your neck, calling that the son of Elohim or the son of God. It is not. The commandment says, thou shall not make any image of any likeness that's in heaven above the earth beneath or the waters that's under the earth. So in the heaven above the earth beneath the earth itself and the waters beneath the earth you should not make any image of anything, nor should you bow down to them, nor shall you serve them or worship them. That is a commandment. And the very commandment that is in the Ten Commandments, the portion that most people say they believe in, that portion of the Ten Commandments is thou should not, uh, uh, they believe in certain ones. They don't do the Sabbath, but they say they believe in the Ten Commandments. So if it say don't make any graven images, how do we still walk around with these images on us thinking it's pleasing to the Most High? It goes back to what it says in the book of Romans. They have went forth to establish their own righteousness. The more, uh, the more jewelry that we can put on with, with articles that supposed to look like righteousness, they've established their own way of worship. Wearing a cross does not make you holy or righteous. Putting on a so-called Jesus piece does not make you holy and righteous. What makes us righteous is if we keep these laws, statutes, and commandments of the Most High and we denounce idolatry. And they have turned the Messiah himself into an idol. Uh, Zakan Yaakov did a very uh, phenomenal job in his two-minute warning of the created idol Jesus, which is not the Hebraic Messiah anyway. So it's a whole nother idol that's been associated with it, with all the fast, the, the, the false worship that comes with the way the church teaches Jesus. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm using the term church. Not that I'm knocking the church, but that's where people go at the learning of the most high. So in the churches, they're still coming forth with an idolatrous doctrine. 
Why? Because our fathers have been doing it. So therefore, this is the custom, this is tradition. They're doing the same things today as the forefathers did of ancient times, all these kings that either did not tear down everything or would always return back to serving um, the false gods based upon the sin that was introduced to them by their forefathers, which is the mindset, the generational curse mindset that we have to break today. All right, drop it down to verse 12. Thus was the word of Yah which he spake unto Jehu, saying, Your son shall sit on the throne of Israel until the fourth generation, and it came to pass. I'm dropping down now to verse 17. Uh, I'm, go, I'm just going to get a couple of the verses just to bring back uh, 17. In the nine and thirtieth year of Azariah, king of Yehuda, began Menahem, the son of Gadi, to reign over Israel, and he reigned ten years in Samaria, and he did evil in the sight of Yah. He departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. So there was a king that was before a lot of these kings that have already introduced sin or missing the mark to Israel or idolatry to Israel. So a lot of these men, when they became kings, they still kept the same customs and the same idolatrous practices as Jeroboam, all right? Drop it down to verse 23. In the 50th year of Azariah, um, that's the one I just read, dropping down to um, 27, sneak out. In the 250th year of Azariah, king of Yehuda, Pekah, the son of Remeliah, began to reign over Israel and, and Samaria and reigned 20 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Again, still following the forefathers still following their sinful ways, their idolatrous worship, their practices. They've established their own way. Yes, I'm a king and I'm in the house of Yah, but we're still going to worship these idols the way that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat did. It is time for us today, Mishmachah, praise be to Yah that he's revealing it to us now, that we have to break that mindset because my parents did it. My grandparents, my great, great, great grands did it. I'm not going to offend them and I'm not going to offend the ancestors. We need to stop offending the Most High Yah. We need to understand that there is nothing new under the sun and it is time for us to wake up and repent because there is a line that's being drawn and the Most High is going to stop playing with us. And when I say us, I don't literally mean us on this line. I just mean with mankind in general. When we start looking at what's going on in the earth right now today, these plagues and pestilence and things that's hitting the earth, and famine and food shortages and things like that, as we get further into some of this lesson, you're going to see that all of that's by Yah. Regardless of what we think the pandemic is or how it came into being, the fact that people are getting sick, the fact that these are food shortages and all this stuff is coming to the earth, this stuff is happening because Yah is allowing things to happen because this world is full of idolatry, wickedness, homosexuality. It is it's just ridiculous. And the Most High is getting fed up. So it, he's given us an opportunity to repent of our sins and transgression and iniquities and to serve him, but we can't keep embracing the ways of our forefathers as they were doing in times of past, times past because they did it. If they were wrong, if they were in error, we must refrain from doing it. Drop it down now to uh, 32. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Amalia, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uziah, king of Judah to reign. Five and 20 years old was he when he began to reign. And he did that which right in the sight of Yah. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Howbeit the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. He built the higher gate to the house of Yah. So he started trying to do some of the things that was right, but he still did not tear down things. Part of the reason why people do not tear down certain things is sometimes you don't want to be offensive. I'm not going to say exactly why they didn't complete their task, but I'm going to say today the reason why sometimes we don't complete our task. Sometimes we are ashamed of our walk, our belief. We are ashamed of being alienated because of what we believe. There's all these different things that we have to grow out of and understand that if everyone's against me, as long as y'all's for me, who cares? Now, yes, we have to be very humble. We can be very compassionate, but we have to let people know that what they're doing is in error, we must proclaim it before them because that's our duty as Israel. That's our duty as a nation of priests. 
to let the world know that they're in sin and we're supposed to proclaim these things, right? But if we don't know better ourselves, and if we are ashamed of our creator, and if we are ashamed that he has awakened us to this truth, then, you know, hey, that's something we need to pray about, that he will strengthen us and we can be bold and courageous as he told Joshua to be. When he told Joshua to be bold and courageous, he told him to be bold and courageous in the law. Why? Because the rest of your brothers and sisters and your nation, a lot of your elders, they're still caught up in the ways of the forefathers. So when you stand and when you come to lead these people, you got to be bold in what you believe. You got to be bold in this Torah. And that's what we're going to have to be also, Israel. Do not let anybody sway you because, the, uh, uh, you know, and it happened to me too. Uh, it happened to me uh, early in my walk and not even also early in my walk, but even mid walk. You get to the point where you feel like, goodness, am I the only one that's trying to do these commandments? You talk to people, they look at you like you're the bad guy. But if that's how they look at you because you love Yah, you love them, then so be it. We have to learn to grow, to love Yah, and know that Yah loves that we're trying to do that, which is right. Moving forward to uh, the 16th chapter, it says, in the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Amalek, uh, uh, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Yehuda, began to reign. 20 years old was Ahaz when he began to reign and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem and did not that which was right in the sight of Yah, his Elohim or his God, like David, his father, but walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Yea, he made his son to pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathen whom Yah cast out from before the children of Israel. And he sacrificed and burned incense in the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So we see here again, there's yet another king who still would not submit to the will of the Most High. He would not follow after King David, who was considered the righteous king, a king after the Most High's own heart, but he still followed the other kings of Israel that still followed the ways of Jeroboam, which still caused Israel to sin. So now we see that from generation to generation, these kings are still following the wicked way. And I'm gonna tell y'all, Mishra Makai, a lot of the times, because this world is consumed with wickedness and consumed with e evil, and the majority, when you feel like you're an outcast, the reason why some people give in, because they give in to the majority, because they want to be accepted. What we have to understand here is that the remnant, the remnant are those who will remain in the most high. No matter how few in number we are, we must remain in Yah and remain in the path that is righteous and do not compromise your walk because of what the majority is doing is in error. Remember, there were only eight that were saved on the ark when all the world was wiped out. And we're going to be touching on a little bit of why the world's wiped out momentarily. All right. So dropping down. So so not only did he not only follow the ways of, of, of the kings of Israel, but he's also following the custom of the heathen. He's now sacrificed his child in the fire. And it says he sacrificed burnt incense in the high places and on high hills and under every green tree. Again, when people are going about to establish their own righteousness. And if anybody's doing these things, listen, there's nothing wrong with burning incense. Incense have aroma. Frankincense and myrrh is one of the most highest smells that he liked. Yes, it is. Um, it was customary that even in Yisrael that, well, they had what's called the menorah. So there was going to be a light in the candlesticks. There was going to be a fragrances that were being burnt in the sanctuary that was going to give a, a good smell cane. However, there are people today that are doing these things in a ritualistic way and it's a way of worship and they're doing these things and they're getting more accustomed to seeking out those things than actually staying rooted in Torah and doing what the Torah says do. And they're getting off into, as I covered last week, off into energies, into ancestors and all this other stuff when the main thing we need to be in is the Torah of Yah. So it says, he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places and on high hills and under every green tree. Drop it down to verse... Um, 10. And King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet with, uh, well, Shlika, Shlika, for one moment. Uh, Maury Dawood, Shlika, sir. Uh, I think he dropped. Uh, let me yield a little bit, Maury. Did you have any words you want to share? No, sir. No, sir. She wants to move on. Um, no, sir. No, sir. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure I, 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 I didn't take, your, take yours from you, Maury. All right. Hallelujah. So moving, moving forward. So now what we're going to see is uh, I don't want to drop that four down. So let me drop it down to verse seven, starting off. So Ahaz sent messages to Tilgaflasar, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Syria and out of the hand of the king of Israel, which rise up against me 
and Ahaz took the silver and gold that was found in the house of Yah and in the treasures of the king's house and sent it a uh, present to the king of Assyria. So now he's taking the, uh, the silver and stuff out of the house of the most high to give to someone as a form of a bribe. Instead of putting his trust and his faith in the most high and living upright, he's even more wicked now because now you've taken the things from the house of Yah and you're going to give it to another, asking to be delivered from another king. Dropping to verse 10. And King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet uh, uh, tiglath Pileser, king of Syria, and saw an altar that was at Damascus. And the king Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest the, the, uh, the fashion of the altar and the pattern of it according to all the workmanship thereof. And Uriah the priest built an altar according to all that the king Ahaz had sent from Damascus. So Uriah the priest made it against king Ahaz from Damascus. So now he's seeing this, uh, this altar. So now he's wanting an altar, like this altar that he's seen at Damascus to be built. So he sent for Uriah the priest to build an altar after this fashion, all right? So, um, and then uh, upon this offering, it says in verse 13, and the burnt, and, and he burnt his burnt offering and his meat offering and poured the drink offering and sprinkled the blood of his peace offerings upon the altar. He brought also the base brazen altar, which was before Yah from the forefront of the house. So now he's reorganizing the way the sanctuary of the Most High is set up uh, and bringing all this stuff now and worshiping uh, to the false one. Dropping down to verse 18 for the sake of time. Um, and the covert for the Sabbath that they had built in the house and the king's entry without turn he from the house of Yah for the king of Assyria. So now something that's in reference to the Shabbat, he's doing away with this um, in, in the entrance of the house of Yah from the house of Yah for the king of Assyria. So you see that a lot of times we just want to follow someone. We are so quick to submit to someone else's authority and to someone else's way that we would do away with the way of the most high, our Elohim, our creator, which delivered us out of the hand of the Egyptians, out of the house of bondage. So disrespectful. Jumping forward to chapter 16, can I knock y'all? I mean, you got to read uh, chapter 17 for me, Adon. Second Malachim, chapter 17, start with verse 1. Second Kings 17. In the 12th year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hoshea, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. Okay, so stop here for one quick second, Kanak. I just want to bring this point out real quick. So we see here Hoshea, right? So the name that Hosea comes from H1954 in Hebrew. Um, and that's going to be one of the words that come from the root word, which is H3467, which is Yesha. This is also where uh, Joshua and Yahusha's name come from, this same root here, um, which is going to be salvation, right? So the point that I want to make is in our community today, there are many people that give themselves a Hebrew name. So it's, it's just because you have a Hebrew name and because you're wearing garments, don't make us righteous. We can have the most righteous name and be unrighteous because we can see here that we have one here that has the name Hosea or Hosea, which is salvation, which is still not a righteous person. Okay, Kanak, you can read it in total from this point. Verse two, and he did that which was evil in the sight of Yah, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. Against him came up Shalmanazir, king of Assyria. And Hosea became his servant and gave him presents. And the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hosea. For he had sent messengers to Seoul, king of Egypt, and brought no present to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria came up throughout all the land, and he went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Assyria, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Halah and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. 
For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against Yah, their lead, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared their and had feared other gods, and walked in the statutes of the heathen, whom Yah cast out from before the children of Israel, and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against Yah their lead. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and of, under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom Yah carried away before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke Yah to anger. For they serve idols. Whereof Yah said unto them, You should not do this thing. Yet Yah testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn you from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks, like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in Yah their lean, and they rejected his statutes and his covenant that they made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom Yah had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of Yah their lean and made the most the images, even two calves and made a grove and worshiped all the hosts of heaven and serve by all. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divinations and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of Yah to provoke him to anger. Therefore, Yah was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Also, Judah kept not the commandments of Yah their lean, but walked in the statutes of Israel which they made. And Yah rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of the spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. And he rent Israel from the house of David. And they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And Jeroboam drave Israel from following Yah and made them sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, they departed not from them. Until Yah removed Israel out of his sight. As he had said by all his servants, the prophets, so was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria until this day. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not Yah. Therefore, Yah sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore, they spoke to the king of Syria, saying, The nations which you have removed and replaced in the cities of Samaria knew not the manner of Elohim of the land. Therefore, he have sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the Elohim of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the, the priests whom you brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let them teach them the manner of the lean of the land. Then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear Yah. Howbeit every nation made gods of their own, and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made and every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon made Sukoth, Benoth, and the men of Kuth made Nergal, and the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak. And the Sephrovites burnt their children in the fire to Adramalek and Anomalek, the gods of the Sephrovians. So they feared Yah, and made unto themselves the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed with them in the houses of the high places. They feared Yah and served their own gods, 
after the man of the nations whom they carried away from this. Until this day, they do after the former manners. They fear not Yah, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and commandment which Yah commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel, with whom Yah made a covenant and charged them saying, you should not fear the gods, nor bow yourself to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But Yah who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and stretched out arm, him shall you fear and him shall you worship. And to him shall you do sacrifice. And the statutes and the ordinances and the law and the commandments, which he wrote for you, you shall observe to do forevermore. And you shall not fear other gods. And the covenant that I made with you, you shall not forget. Neither shall you fear other gods. But Yahweh, you shall fear. And he shall deliver you out of the hand of all your enemies. Howbeit they did not hearken but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared Yah and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of reading in this chapter. I'm just gonna try to build on a couple of points. So um, uh, back to 17, so it says, uh, we know Hosea, the son of Eli, he was reigning um, over Israel. He did that which was evil in the sight of Yah. So remember, I said, keep that in mind, how these kings were always doing that which was evil in the sight of Yah. And we see that it goes through and it explains how the way of Jeroboam had corrupted all of them because they all, all Israel keep going back to the ways of Jeroboam because he corrupted them. He introduced the sin to Israel. Therefore, Israel continues in the sin. What we're reading all through this chapter is how Yah dealt with Israel for this idolatry for the sinful way. And as uh, uh, verse uh, six, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria uh, and he carried away into Assyria and placed it in Hala and Habar by the river. Verse seven, for so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against Yah their Elohim, which he had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other mighty ones. So again, it's referencing again how the Most High brought them out of Egypt. So it's nothing even different during this time than it is for us today. It's always referencing how Yah brought Israel out of Egypt to come to worship and to serve him. So even here that we're reading in the book of the Kings is that these forefathers, they still had to reference the word of the forefathers that were before them and how Israel was brought out of Egypt so that they could serve the most high. However, they still came out and still did not fear and want to serve other mighty ones or other gods and walked in the statutes of the heathen whom Yah cast out from before them, from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. So again, still submitting themselves to their own righteousness, but not submitting to the righteousness of the most high, the most high who delivered them, they still refused to serve him. And that's what goes on today. We, could, we have the book right before our face. And it's written that he delivered Israel and why he delivered Israel, how he delivered them and what he asked Israel to do. And we will still walk on the false doctrine that tells us to do idolatry. It just don't make sense. I can't even understand how our forefathers who had a closer relationship and more of an opportunity than what I think we even have today, how they kept doing this nonsense. But what's even worse for us today is that we got it in the, on the pages of the book. We can read it in our own homes. We don't just have to go to the synagogue on a Sabbath day for somebody to read this word to us. The word is printed. We have several copies in each home today. We're reading it and we're still caught up in idolatry. This is nonsense. The Most High brought his people out to come and worship him. To be holy means to be quadash or set apart. Different than everyone else. We can't look like, talk like, act like, be like worship like we must be different he said israel you're a peculiar people you are my peculiar treasure so you're supposed to be looked at as strange see we still got to learn our custom and our culture and when you learn what words actually mean as i can herman said start looking up words that you think that you know that you know peculiar in one instance can be a good thing but to some people when they say somebody's peculiar they're calling you strange 
So to the Most High, he said, you're special to him because you're peculiar. You're peculiar to everybody else because you're strange to everybody else. Why? Because you're not caught up in their customs. Let them call you strange. Let them talk about how you dress. But if you know the word that the Most High said, he's going to come back and judge people that's dressed in heathenistic apparel, we shouldn't want to dress like heathens. We shouldn't want to act like heathens. We should want to be different. But if we're not being taught our culture, if we're not, if we don't even understand ourselves today still, why the most high put Israel into captivity once again, it has never been any different reason as to why Israel has ever went into captivity. For idolatry, the number one sin from the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden, the very first sin was the idolatry. Uh, adversary telling them to worship a way that the most high told them not to worship following their own way and doing what they wanted to do and not serving the Most High. Every captivity has been because Israel did not submit to the will of the Most High. So why do we think it's different in 2022? It's not. It's not been different anyway in the word. It's been the same results, the same reason. Because people would not yield to the Most High. He wakes people up, he gives them an opportunity and they rebel, they reject. He sends them teachers. We just read it here. They went into the land. They were doing after the heathens. And he sent lions in to start eating and killing people. When they heard what was going on, they said they did not even know how to worship Elohim. Send somebody to them to teach them. They sent people to say, listen, serve Yah. Here's how you worship. See, these people, this is what they did. This is how they worship. You're not supposed to do this. And the people still rebel after being taught. So yes, there are sins of ignorance. And ignorance don't mean that you have to agree with it. Ignorance is, and I'm going to tell you this right now, ignorance is the reason why, now I do believe that before this truth really came out like it is in our era, there is a lot of our parents, and when I say parents, I mean grandparents from slavery times, from some times past that weren't able to read. There's a lot more ignorance that got winked at for them because they could not read. They could only go by what they were taught, but they still sung Kumbaya. They still had a uh, Ruach, the, uh, the attachment to the land before they lost all that over hundreds of years of slavery. But they still had some knowing how to pray to the creator and they did the best they could. And then when reading was stripped from a person, you don't know how to read. So you have a certain ignorance. The most I was going to wink at it. But in 2022, with all these books in the churches, I don't care what pastors say, if you can read it and it says it, it's not too much room to keep claiming ignorance. The most high sins, now rejecting, as we've already covered in the book of Shemuel or Samuel, it says for, uh, 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 sins of witchcraft, stubbornness is as idolatry. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So if you're rebelling the word of the most high, that's witchcraft. And to be stubborn, that's the form of idolatry. You're remaining in the place that the most high is telling you to move from. To be a Hebrew is not just about a skin color or a language. It's even, do you even understand what the word Hebrew means? A bar means to cross over, to go beyond. So Abraham, who was called the Hebrew, was told to leave from his family. Get out of your father's house. It's full of idolatry. Go and learn, yeah, you go back and you bring your family out of idolatry, but you don't go back and you partake with their idolatry. You go back and you show them that it's wrong. Abraham made mockery of his father's way of worship. His father got upset with him, but Abraham didn't just say, oh, that's what my father damn did. So I'm going to keep doing what Nimrod. No, he followed Yah. So if we can comprehend the scriptures, if we can comprehend what we read, then that's the mindset we have to have to break that generational curse mindset. Because it's not a generational curse, it's a generational curse mindset of still doing what our forefathers have done that's in sin and caused us to walk in sin. But Abraham let that stuff go because he crossed over. He went to a place where Yah called him to. Yah is calling us spiritually to a place to let go of idolatry and false worship, and we must walk to that place. And we can't keep holding on because, oh, I don't want to throw this away because grandma passed and it's all I have to remember grandma. No, remember your grandmother because of the memory of your grandmother. Remember them good dinners that she would cook for you. Remember the change of your diaper and the raising you up, getting you off the bus 
Remember those things. You don't have to remember a false way of worship and some idols, the stuff that we attach ourselves to. We have to learn to let go of this stuff, and that's what Abraham did. And I'm speaking this with some urgency, Mr. Picard, because the days and the times are changing. If we're not looking at what's going on in the world today, it is time for us to let the creator, the most high Yah know that we want to be his sons and his daughters and we love him. And we want to serve him. And if he will continue to reveal unto us our sinful ways, that we will repent and not be like the stiff-necked Israel of the past that would still reject and rebel against the word of the most high because they've submitted themselves to their own righteousness, or their own righteousness but not the righteous of Elohim. So now we can see the continuity between the Brit Kadashah, which is commonly called the New Testament or the Renewed Covenant, and the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. So they had to send these men to them to teach them. So now I'm dropping down to verse um, 10. Um, no, verse 9. The children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against Yah their Elohim, and they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchmen to the fence city and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places and did the heathen whom, as did the heathen whom Yah carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke Yah to anger for they served idols. Wherefore Yah had said unto them, ye have not do... You shall not do this thing. So again, they try to secretly still do their customs of the heathens as if we're hiding it from the most high. There's brothers and sisters in the walk right now that will Shabbat Shalom you, go Shalom Ak you, go have on a Hebrew garment and they're dibbling and dabbling in some nonsense in this walk also. It has crept in as it has always been in because there's been a crafty council from the beginning of the time to make the name of Yah be no more in remembrance. And so Israel will not remember who we are, whose we are, and who and how we're supposed to serve him. So it says they burnt incense in all the high places and did the, as did the heathen. Stop following the traditions of man and follow the Torah of Yah. And it's nothing that we can do in secret. It says the most high knows the intent of the hearts of man. The most high knows if we're ignorant to what we're doing and he knows if we're willingly doing it. He knows if we're rebelling or rejecting this walk. And I will say for those who are newer, just remain the course. At first, this walk starts off enjoyable and then it will turn bitter. It starts off enjoyable and then it turns bitter. It turns bitter because some of the things you have to change and give up, the way people may start treating you, there's a little bitterness that goes with it also. And because some things is also going to be foreign to us, it's foreign to us because we're not accustomed to doing it. It doesn't feel comfortable. So me and one of my brothers were having a talk today about how we had to give up bacon and pork. There was a time when that used to be good to us. We used to enjoy it. But as, uh, 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 as one of my um, uh, friends was at the house uh, last night, they had to come over. When he was here last night, he was talking about how I got a nose where I can smell pork because I haven't ate it in so long. And, you know, and how he tried back in the day when I first stopped eating pork and certain things, he was like, I was going to try to do it with you. But when I would go to my mom's house, they, they got all this pork, and this and that and the third, it was just hard to let go. And I do know that there's going to be certain things for us, not just the dietary, but there's going to be dif different things in the walk that's going to be hard for us to, to gravitate towards sometimes. And it's going to be difficult just because we're not accustomed to doing it. However, remain the course. And the longer you remain the course, whether you understand it or not, if you can comprehend the most, I say you shall not do something or you shall do something, whether you enjoy doing it or not, if the most I say do it, just do it. If you like doing something that the most I say you shall not do, read you comprehend the why he say I can't do it, forget the why you can't do it. He said, don't do it. That's all we need. We just need to know he said, don't do it. Well, why he said don't eat pork? Yeah, I can go into all the unhealthy reasons why we should eat pork, but I shouldn't have to. He said, don't. That's why. 
Don't have idols. That's why. Don't always have to have the extra question as, well, I don't, I don't understand why he say this. You don't have to understand why he says it. Just do what he says do. And what will happen is over time, as you grow, then those things will become a part of you. And now the, the same way that I used to enjoy pork, I don't even look at it as food. It disgusts me. Why? Because I walk out what the most I told me to walk out. And as I matured and as he filled me more and more with his ruach, that is not food to me to the point where I get sick by the smell of it. And if I definitely eat it, I'm going to be sick. If it gets slipped in and you couldn't detect the smell because it might have been covered under something and you kind of just got that little bite in and then you start feeling that sickness and you know, like you can, when once you bite into the taste, you're like, ah, it's got pork on it. And it makes you feel some type of way all day knowing that you did that. Why? Because now your ruach is now being in, in alignment with the Most High's word. So at first, some things are not going to be comfortable. But see, that's the reason why some people don't want to serve the Most High, because they don't want to give up their comforts and their desires. But when you actually continue to walk on the path that the Most High has called you to, it will get easier and the enjoyment will return that it was when you first started the journey. And some things that you have to let go of is going to be uncomfortable. And some things that you're going to have to start doing may be uncomfortable. But if the Most High says do it, whether you understand it or not, if you can comprehend, he says do it, then do it. And over time, his Holy Spirit or his Ruach HaKodesh will give you the understanding as to the why he said wear fringes. As to the why he said keep Shabbat. All right, so moving on. Um, so it says in verse 12, for they serve idols wherefore Yah had said unto them, ye shall not do. Yet Yah testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers saying, turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to the Torah or the law, which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. So again, we see the Most High has always sent his servants. He's always sent the prophets to speak unto his people to tell them to get right. So y'all have provoked me to anger, but what I'm telling you is, here is how you worship me. Here is what I want you to do. I don't care about your Jesus piece around your neck. That's an idol, take it off. You're not pleasing me doing that. I know you think it's a good gesture and you think it means something. It means wickedness, take it off. What I want you to do is serve me in spirit and in truth. Just do what my word said. I would rather have obedience than sacrifice. Kanaka, if you could jump me to the book of Deborah, or Deuteronomy chapter 32, and just drop right down to verse 21. Deborah, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and 21. Because we're seeing here that the Most High saying they provoked him to anger. But let's jump to Deuteronomy, which is one of the books of the law, chapter 32, verse 21, Kanaka, y'all. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not a lean. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. And I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Hallelujah. So Yah's word has already been prophesied about some of the conditions that his people will be in. But he also told you the why his people will be in a condition experiencing certain things. So it says, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God, which is not Elohim. So my people whom I brought out of Egypt, who I freed, who I provided everything for, they always turn back and give credit to some heathen God. And that makes me jealous, says the Most High, our Father. So as he gets angry, he gets jealous with that. He said, okay, I'm going to give them a dose of taste of their own medicine. What I'm going to do is since they provoke me to jealousy with that, which is not a God and because of their vanities and their wickedness and all their nonsense, I'm going to make them angry by what? Putting them in slavery, putting nations over them. So you can see that continually Israel has been in captivity under nation, nation, and nation. This continually they're in captivity to nations. But why is that again? Idolatry. Israel has always been in captivity because of idolatry. Don't hate the people that you are captive under. Hate the reason why you're captive under a nation that the most I said is not a people anyway. 
Don't hate the people. Hate what we're doing wrong or what our forefathers did wrong. Hate that and stop doing it. See, we get caught up in hating the people. It's not for you to hate the people. The Most High's word has already promised that this is what I will do to you because of how you treated me. Since you will not serve me and be grateful for what I've done to you, and you made me jealous because you always want to turn to these idols that are nothing, I'm going to put a people over you that's not even considered my people. And you're going to be beneath them. They're going to oppress you because of your sin, not because of your skin color. Because of your sin is why they're going to oppress you. And the reason for this is because I'm provoking you to jealousy. So when they're living rich, when they got the big house and the nice cars, and you sitting there wanting to know why you're not getting paid the same on a job, stop talking about that and, and be thankful you got a job. But understand that these, this is a condition that's a part of the curse of the Most High for sin and for idolatry. And the way out of it is not to speak against the nation or nations. The way out of it is to denounce idolatry, vanity, and wickedness. Verse 14, notwithstanding they would not hear but harden their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in Yah the Elohim and they rejected his statutes or his ordinances, his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them and they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom God had charged them that they should not do like them. We're still doing the same thing today. Want to know why the, why the Most High ain't freeing you? And I'm not literally saying you, I'm just saying it in, 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 a, general, in a general term. Why he's not freeing us? Why are we going through this? We're still idolaters. We are idolaters. And it is time for us now to stop being fearful to let our family know these things. Again, as I said, use wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Make sure that you are walking upright in your family's sight before the Most High because you don't want to be full of sin yourself going trying to correct somebody about something because now that's going to be like taking the Most High's name in vain because they can't receive the word from somebody that still, they still view as a clown. But if they've seen changes in your life and you're doing this thing and you're serious about your walk, then share with them with wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and compassion and love that, look, I'm telling you this because I love you. And as, as I went into tonight, the reason why Israel has always been in captivity has been because of idolatry, has been because they would not worship the Most High according to knowledge and they would not submit to the righteousness of Elohim, as it said in the book of Romans chapter 10, but they would go about to establish their own righteousness after their grandma or their granddad, their great-great-granddad or their forefathers after the sins of Jeroboam, the king of Israel who introduced sin to Israel or after the sins of Eve who when she took a bite of the forbidden, she introduced us all the sin. So now we gravitate to the sin more than we do to the Most High, but Most High forbid that be us. Let us denounce that idolatry and, and understand, Mr. Rakai, there's nothing new under the sun. This is the reason why the Most High has always punished Israel for putting other gods before him and they provoked him to jealousy with those gods, okay? So I'm gonna yield, uh, no, no, let me get this a little bit more. Um, go to verse, uh, I'm dropping down to, so of course we know it said they started doing enchantments. They sold themselves to do evil in the sight of Yah in verse uh, 17. Uh, they was giving their children over uh, with this false way of worship. In verse 18, it said, therefore, Yah was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Yehuda only. Also, Judah kept not the commandments of Yah, their Elohim, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they, which they made. So instead of, so now he said he moved all Israel, because remember the house was divided in between the northern and southern kingdom. So you have the house of Judah and the house of Israel, which is still all Israelites, but it's two different houses. So it said the whole house of Israel was moved because of this idolatry. But then it says, so the only one that remained in the sight of Yah was Judah. But also Judah kept not the commandments of Yah, their Elohim, but walked in the statues of Israel, which they made. So Israel made their way of worship. 
The same way in the churches today, they've created a way of worship. And instead of us worshiping the Most High according to his word, we still want to gravitate towards what our brothers and sisters, what our uh, uh, forefathers have established with religion, and we still do not want to submit to the righteousness of the Most High. And that is not pleasing in the sight of the Most High. It says, verse 20, and Yah rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of the spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. For he rent Israel from the house of David and they made Jeroboam the son of the bot king and Jeroboam drove Israel from following Yah and made them sin a great sin for the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, they departed not from them. So again, Mishmachah, we can see here that that made Yah say, I don't want y'all in my face. So um, it's, it's sort of like a parent. And let's look at it as a parent. If your child has not been doing what you asked them to do, the grades down, they haven't been doing their chores, haven't been doing what's pleasing in your sight, and they're just rebellious and always doing what somebody else's parents allow them to do and want to be like somebody else's children because what somebody else's household do, are you going to re reward them? You can get out of my face with that nonsense. Let's put it in a, in a way we can see. What we have to start doing is understanding that we're supposed to be created in the image of the Most High. The Most High is called our Father, which the Most High is our parent. So we who are parents have been told to honor our father and mother. The first father that we're all supposed to honor is the Most High who is in heaven. So as a parent yourself, if your child runs and references some other family member more than you and you're the one that brought them into this world, you're the one who fed, clothed, and took care of them, but now they get to an age where they want to gravitate toward the sinful side, let them come running to you and want a blessing from you. You don't want to bless them. Get out of my face. Go ahead back over there where you was at. Go ask that wicked one to bless you. Y'all say he wanted Israel out of his sight because of idolatry. Why? Since y'all love that idol so much, go be with that idol. And y'all can be with that idol, not in your land. I'm kicking you out of your land and I'm sending you to some nations that's going to be over you. And that's where you're going to be jealous and you're going to be miserable. And when you're in the land, if you read with the words of the prophet, he said, I send you the prophets. The prophets tell you how to return back to the Most High. And he tells you when you're in the land where you are, that you are to repent and to crowd into the Most High. And if we do what is right, the Most High will gather us back to the place which is set apart. But he's not going to bring us back if we still are dollars. I kicked you out because you were dollars. So lose your idolatry in the land of your oppression, in the land of your captivity. When you lose that as a nation and learn to walk in righteousness, then the Most High will deliver you back into your land. So I'm going to yield here in this portion. And let's pick up in the book of, I'm, I'm going to share my screen because I know everybody don't have it. So give me a moment. Let me share my screen. Just want to give just a little bit of the historical. Just want to tie something in real quick. Kanak, y'all, don't pause. Just read. If I need you to stop, uh, I'll stop you for the sake of time. Let's try to get as much as we can. We go into the book of Yashar or the book of Jasher. Yashar or the book of Jasher. This is one of the history books that is written with some of the history of things that happened in times past for those that are not familiar with it as of yet. And at some point, I would go into um, a detailed uh, uh, study on some of the books that we read and support. But for the sake of time tonight, this is one of the books that's written as a history book that fills in things that took that that uh, that happened that we've already read from the Bible, but it gives us a little bit more of an informative understanding of what was going on during those times. So let's go to the book of Yashar, the book of Jasher, um, and chapter one, and start with verse one, Kanak, and read it with a little bit of speed, and don't pause as much for the sake of time. I, I want to get to some points. Jasher chapter one, verse one. And Elim said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And Elim created man in his own image. And Elim formed man from the ground and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul endowed with speech. Yah said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him and help me. And Yah caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and took away one of his ribs and he built flesh upon it and Chapter formed it. And Yahweh took, took Adam and his woman and placed 
them in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to guard it. And he commanded them and said unto them, From every tree of the garden you may eat, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you should not eat. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And when Elim had blessed and commanded them, he went from them, and Adam and his woman dwelt in the garden according to the command which Yah had commanded them. And the serpent which Elim had created with them in the earth came to them to incite them to transgress the commandment of Elim. Okay, so Paul which he had. So we see here that this is lining up with uh, what we read in Genesis, how the Most High created man. And then from the man, he created the woman and he gave him his help me. So now they're in the earth and he also commanded them what to refrain from. Do not partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's not for you. Everything else here is for you, but stay away from that. But now the serpent came to them to incite them to transgress the command of Elohim or of God, which he commanded them. So from the very beginning, the most high was given commandments to man. He gave commandments to Adam and Eve in the garden, told them exactly how he wanted them to do things. But again, the adversary came to incite them to transgress the commandment of the Most High. Verse 10, Adon. And the serpent enticed and persuaded the woman to eat from the tree of knowledge. And the woman hearkened to the voice of the serpent. And she transgressed the word of Yah and took from the tree the knowledge of good and evil. And she ate and she gave it, and she took from it and gave also to her man and he ate. And Adam and his woman transgressed the command of Elohim, which he commanded them. And Elohim knew it, and his anger was kindled against them, and he cursed them. So pause. So again, nothing new under the sun. So he gave them very specific rules, regulations, and ordinances. So he gave them commandments at that time, told them, do not do this. And regardless of what anyone else says, they should have never gave in. I don't care what order it happened in. I don't care if the woman was first. Man and woman, we are in sin because of that transgression. They should have never listened. So what did they do? They listened to another voice over the voice of the Most High. And family, I'm going to tell you, it's no different today. There are voices in our heads today. There is the voice of the adversary or the spirit of error. And it's going to be the spirit of Yah or the spirit of truth. And that adversary will always be trying to get you to think contrary to the word and the will of the Most High. So it enticed him. He made it excited and inviting to the woman. The woman partook, and then she also introduced it to the man, and now they're in sin. It says that Adam and his woman transgressed the command of Elohim, or God, which he commanded them, and Elohim, or God, knew it, and his anger was kindled against them, and he cursed them. So we can see that even from the very beginning, there is always a curse that comes with breaking the word of the Most High and for submitting to someone else. So why do we think it's any different in 2022, 2021, how we have in the church today feeling like we don't have to do the word of the most high and it's just perfectly fine. But if we're reading what's called the Bible, as they call it, if you're reading the Bible, it's the same throughout from the beginning to the ending that this happens. Uh, there's a curse associated with breaking the words of the most high. Verse 12. Y'all hey, drove, drove them from that day from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which they were taken. And they went and dwelt at the east of the Garden of Eden. And Adam knew his wife, Kua, or Eve, and she bore two sons and three daughters. And she called the name of the firstborn Cain, saying, I have obtained a man from Yah. And the man of the name of the other was called Havel, or Abel. For she said, in vanity, we came into the earth, and in vanity, we shall be taken from it. And the boys grew up, and their father gave them a possession in the land. And Cain was until of the ground, and Abel were keeper of sheep. And it was at the expiration of a few years that they brought an approximating offering to Yah. Okay, and so Cain we already know about the Cain and Abel story. But one of the things is, so their first child, which was Cain, we know he was what? What you say, Zah? He was a killer, huh? He was a killer, all right? But we know Cain was pretty much wicked. He killed his brother. He was wicked. Why do we really think that Cain was going to, <laughs> their first child was wicked? What were they? They were y'all's children, right? And what did they do? They did wickedness. So their first child ended up being a wicked killer or murderer who murdered his own brother. 
And that is because of their behavior, because they did not follow the commandments of the Most High. If they would have been in righteousness, if they would have never introduced certain things within themselves, it is highly likely that son would not have been an evil son to start with. All right. Let's drop down um, Kanat, um, to verse... As a matter of fact, let's jump, jump right over to chapter two for the sake of time. So we know that uh, we know about Cain, uh, Cain and Abel. So um, let's jump over to uh, chapter two. Sleep God, let me get it. Uh, I got, hold on. Y'all bear with me. I don't know why I don't just change. Uh, Y'all bear with me. I don't know why it doesn't work the same on here. All right, take it two from the top. And it was in the 130th year of the life of Adam upon the earth that he again knew Eve, his woman. She conceived and bore a son in his likeness and in his image. And she called his name Sheth, saying, because Elohim had appointed me another seed in the place of Abel, for Cain had slain him. And Sheth lived 105 years and begot a son. And Sheth called the name of the son Enosh, saying, because in that time the sons of men began to multiply and to, aff and to afflict their souls and hearts by transgression and rebellion against Elohim. And it was in the days of Enosh that the sons of men continued to rebel and transgress against Elohim to increase the anger of Yah against the sons of men. And the sons of men went and they served other Elohim and they forgot Yah who had created them in the earth. And in those days, the sons of men made images of brass and iron, wood and stone, and they bowed down and served them. So hold here for a second. So now we see that mankind is wicked. So uh, I do want to cover that. So Cain came out being wicked, but then it said the uh, then they had Seth was, was, was in the image. So we're supposed to be in the image of the Most High. So they had the wicked son that wasn't in the image of the Most High, nor of who they were supposed to be. Then they end up having Seth, which is going to be the righteous seed. But now we see that during this very time, in the very beginning, men began to afflict their souls and hearts by transgressing and rebelling against Elohim or God. And it was in verse three, and it was in the days of Enos that the sons of men continued to rebel and transgress against Elohim to increase the anger of Yah against the sons of men. And the sons of men went and they served other Elohim or other gods and they forgot Yah who had created them in the earth. And in those days, the sons of men made images of brass and iron, wood and stone, and they bowed down and served them. Nothing new under the sun. This is before Moses. This is before there was even an Israelite. This is in the beginning with Adam and Eve and the children and the beginning of mankind. How when you read in the book of Genesis chapter six, it says man mind was continually evil. This is what we're seeing right here. What were they doing when he said that back then? They were building idols and images at that time out of wood and stone, bowing to them and serving them. Verse five, can I read on? And every man made his Elohim, and they bowed down to them. And the sons of men forsook Yah all the days of Enos and his children. And the anger of Yah was kindled on account of their works and abominations which they did in the earth. And Yah caused the waters of the river Guys, he sown to overwhelm them, and he destroyed and consumed them, and he destroyed the third part of the earth. And notwithstanding this, the sons of men did not turn from their evil ways, and their hands were yet extended to do evil in the sight of Yah. So hold it for a second. This is gonna be my first question of the night. <laughs> so what did y'all just comprehend out of that? What what's something y'all just got out of that little portion that we just read? Those last few verses that y'all read. Uh, I'll take like the first three. If anybody has something, I'll give you uh, just uh, uh, about 60 seconds to uh, state your case. So what, what are we seeing here? And I don't know if any hands are, uh, let me uh, go to the screen. Hold on a second. Okay. So the anyway. very first flood. Hmm? Uh -huh. Okay, we, we, we said we got the very first flood. Okay, we got the very first flood even though we didn't get to that point yet. So yeah, we know the first flood was going to be there. So that is true. But what I'm saying is, why? 
What are we seeing here? By it, Francis? Shabbat shalom, everyone. Uh, what I'm getting is that um, men just continue to be evil and the most high is running out of patience. They just keep being evil. It doesn't matter what's done or said. They just continue to be evil. All right. So say they just continue to be evil. All right. Uh, uh, Shai Shamar, floor is yours. And then Zakei Yaakov, you can go right after Shai. So no praise to the most high. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, it just seems like the story, you know, that constantly plays out, you know, in Torah. Um, you know, it, I would say, you know, it even reminds me of, you know, the famous uh, chapter, you know, Dabarine or Deuteronomy chapter 28. You know, you, you have, you know, people being cursed for not doing what the Most High told them to do, you know. <laughs> yeah, nothing new, I yield. All right, Zakan Yaikwa. Um, all right. um, they pretty much hit everything uh, I was going to say, but we see here, too, that that they just kindled the, the jealousy and the anger in the most high over and over again till it was like, hey, look, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of, uh, of the way uh, they're disrespecting me. So I'm going to do something about it. Hallelujah. So as I can say that the most high is tired of the way they disrespecting me. So I'm going to do something about it. Right. But what I want us to look at for when we talk to family, friends, and loved ones. See, we comprehend it for ourselves as what's going on, but be very visual with them. Men forsook Yah. The anger of Yah was kindled on account of the abominations. What were the abominations? They created other gods. They worshiped other gods. Nothing new under the sun. Idolatry. So why is it that we will say in 2022 that we must cry out and spin out, lift up our voice like a trumpet. Why? Because we need the people to be able to see and understand that the very first flood, the very first destruction was coming on the people because they would not submit to the righteousness of Elohim. And because they were actually, see, when I say this is the historical find, when you read in the um in just the Bible uh, 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 version only, it's getting you right to the point. The most high destroyed the people because they was wicked and they didn't help Mo Noah build the ark. But what's not all there is, it told you they was extremely wicked continually. What this is not giving you is what was their wickedness? Idolatry. Worshiping how they wanted to worship and refusing whatever his word has ever been, not doing his word. So now why is it of utmost importance for us to try to tell our friends and families what they're learning is wrong. And here's why we speak so adamantly and so sometimes they may think so hard because we love you. And as Zakane said, the most high gets fed up at some point with us disrespecting him. You're under a doctrine that tells you you don't have to keep his laws when his whole word has always been about people breaking his laws to worship how they want to worship by listening to some heathens, by listening to some false ones, by doing what they want to do and by building idols. Idolatry is the main reason why the earth was flooded. There was other wickedness, yes, but it's letting you know right now the abomination they were doing where they was worshiping and they refused to submit to the Most High. No matter how much word that he would send to them, the people would forsake him. Every man made his Elohim and bowed down to them and the sons of men forsook Yah. So whenever you're worshiping another way and whenever you're putting these idols up, that is the way that you're forsaking Yah. All the days of Enosh and his children and the anger of Yah was kindled on account of their works and the abomination which they did in the earth. It says, and Yah dest destroyed the third part of the earth notwithstanding. This the sons of man did not turn from the evil ways as Yamain said. And so whatever happens, they still just do whatever. It's like they just don't want to get right. Call it for you, will that, uh, uh, verse seven, can I, guy? And in those days, there was neither sowing nor reaping in the earth. And there was no food for the sons of men. And the famine was very great in those days. And the seed which they sowed in those days in the ground became thorns, thistles, and briars. For from the days of Adam 
was just the declaration concerning the earth of the curse of Elohim, with which he cursed the earth on account of the sin of Adam's sin, which Adam sinned before Yah. And it was when men continued to rebel and transgress against Elohim and to corrupt their ways that the earth also became corrupt. And Enos lived 90 years and begot Canaan. And Canaan grew up when he was 40 years old and he became a wise and had knowledge and skill and all wisdom. And he reigned over all the sons of men and he led the sons of men to wisdom and knowledge. For Canaan was a very wise man and had understanding and all wisdom. And with his wisdom, he ruled over spirits and devils. And Canaan knew by his wisdom that Elohim would destroy the sons of men for having sinned upon earth, that Yah would in latter days bring upon them the waters of the flood. And in those days, Canaan wrote upon tablets of stone what was to take place in time to come. And he put them in his treasures. And Canaan reigned over the whole earth, and he turned some of the sons of Elohim Excuse me, the sons of men to the service of Elohim. All right, told I told I told I don't. Great reading tonight. You read a lot. Hallelujah. So, so now we see here now this Canaan. It says uh, he was wise. He was understanding of all wisdom. Uh, he ruled over the rule rule of spirits and devils. Canaan knew by his wisdom. He knew by his wisdom that Elohim would destroy the sons of men for having sinned upon the earth. Are we not wise enough today just from reading all this word that the Most High has left for us that at some point the Most High word is going to come back around where he's going to destroy again? Canaan by his wisdom that Elohim, he knew by his wisdom that Elohim would destroy the sons of men for having sinned upon the earth and Yahuwah would in the latter days bring upon them the waters of the flood. So there was already some things that was happening, but now he knew that, look, they just still not getting it. So when the Most High did, did away with a third part of them, they still didn't listen. They still remained in wickedness. Canaan knew of his wisdom and the righteousness that he walked in, that the day is going to come, the Most High is going to be so fed up that he's going to destroy all them. And the prophetic vision was with him he wrote about the flood. The flood going to happen. The Most High going to kill everybody. Because no matter what he does, no matter how many messengers he sent, y'all still stuck on stupid. Not ignorance. You stuck on stupid. You want to be dummies. You want to be sinful. It says, and so in those days, Canaan wrote upon tablets of stone what was to take place in time to come, and he put them in the treasures. And Canaan reigned over the whole earth and he turned some of the sons of men to the service of Elohim. And I'm going to stop at this point. So what we looked at is because of the sin and because of the idolatry, it also said there was going to be a what? A famine. Mishpachah, family, have we not just experienced little shortages of food? Yes, we're still eating good. So some people still ain't taking it quite serious enough. But when I hear my Isha talking about spaghetti sauce used to be like a dollar and something. And now it's three dollars. You should get three. You know how they say three for the price of one? Literally, you should get three for the price of one, which means that's less food and more money to obtain what we used to have in our house called groceries. At some point, it's going to get less and less. This pandemic, this government shutdown, whatever causes it to come into being, we will hit and I'm going to tell you what I believe that was. It was a trial run by the evildoers of the earth that's trying to set their government in place and going to try to kill some of us off. That's in the natural sense. But in the spiritual sense, I believe that's the most high saying, are y'all going to wake up and start seeing things are different now? It is getting worse. I'm trying to wake y'all up. You better stop playing with me. Y'all better start studying your word. You better realize it's time to be real and not just doing church. It's time to repent, transform, be renewed, denounce idolatry, because as I destroy before, I will destroy again. But leading up to my destruction, there will be famine. There will be plagues. There will be now going back to Matthews. You've already read it before. There will be wars, rumors of wars. There will be plagues. There will be all these different things that will be happening. It has already started. 
But the thing is, habit is we didn't have eyes sometimes to see it. He's now starting to bring things clearer and clearer. I'm not trying to prophesy to you when the end is because Noah couldn't tell them when the end was. But Noah told them to prepare themselves and to come out. Canaan was telling people the truth of the Most High back before the flood ever came. And the flood was prophesied even before Noah even had to build an ark. And they still didn't submit to the words of prophecy that was already written on stones by someone that had turned some men to the service of the Most High Elohim. So what I was trying to show with this, Mishmachai, there's nothing new under the sun. As we read in Corinthians, as we've been going over for our series on idolatry, my brothers and sisters, flee idolatry. Idolatry and false worship has been the reason why the Most High has destroyed his people in times past and will be the very same reason why the Most High will destroy people again. Because idolatry is the a most disrespectful sin. It is disrespectful. It offends the Most High. It makes the Most High jealous because he's the one who blesses with the gift of life. He breathed into us the breath of life. He gave us law, statutes, commandments. He gave us our children, our food, our shelter, our rain. He gave us everything. And the last thing we should ever do is give reference to another. I pray and I hope that everyone got wisdom, knowledge, and understanding from this portion. My heart's desire, as uh, Paul said, my heart's desire is for Israel that we all may be saved. But I bear us a record that we have a zeal of the most high, but not according to knowledge. So let us continue to get the knowledge of the most high so that we will discontinue walking in idolatry and we will submit to his will and his way that we may walk our salvation out and we may endure to the end. With that, I say, Selah. I pray and I hope that the word was well received and that I edified it to the point where you got a visual as to what displeases the most high. And at this moment, I'm going to yield the floor now to the elders first. If there's any words to say, I'm going to let the elders speak on. Um, open it to the emails first. And of course, I can't, Yaquab, you know, anything that you uh, want to share, uh, uh, as I can, you definitely can share. But uh, I'm going to open the floor to the elders first. So I give all honor and esteem to the Most High. Mishra Kha, it's time for us to get really serious with our walk. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Ima. I just want to say that it was a tov lesson and very well edified. Mute on mic. All praise, honesty, me to the Most High. Barak, His Kodash name. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. Tov, tov, tov lesson. All praise, all praise. It's total rabbi, Ima. Total for your words. Zakan Yaakov, if you had anything to add, sir, the floor is yours. I'm told I'm already. Hello, yeah. Hello, yeah. Uh, told, told lesson, uh, Maury. Um, you know, I, I, I write notes down as, as, as you're going through the lesson, you know, and, and something I might um, reiterate or something like that at the end of your lesson. But you, you hit, you hit every, every note that I, that I had in there. Uh, one thing I just want to say too is, is, you know, you brought out that, um, you know, these, these kings, like when we read in Kings, how these kings followed the wickedness of their fathers. I'm not making an excuse, but we go through the same thing today, like you said, you know, like like um, the people wanted to live in that sin, you know, and they were putting pressure on those kings and, and those kings that didn't have the courage because um, they would, they, you know, they would, they were, they had to write down out of the book of the law. They knew the law, you know, and, and they were supposed to recite the law daily. Um, they knew, but 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 because it might be, you know, and I'm not I'm not making no excuses for them, but the people wanted to live in that wickedness too. And so the king probably didn't, I'm not gonna say probably, some of those kings didn't have the courage to stand up to the people, you know. Um, it was it was ruthless back in those days. If, if they didn't like you, there was a coup, a coup would come against you, you know, and some of those, some of those kings would rather please the people instead of please the most high. The same thing going on with us today that you brought out, uh, Moray, that some of us are just kind of, we don't have the courage to stand up to our family and our friends, so we kind of turn a blind eye to it, you know, um, um, and it truly is uh, when we, when we, when you brought out um, the witchcraft part, you know, people are under, 
People are under a spell and that's crafty, 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 crafty counsel. You know, that's why a lot of us, hallelujah, that the most high opened our eyes and, and, and shook us out of that, that trance, you know, but some, some of our brothers and sisters are still in that trance. And I think we better, we got to remember that when we try and, and witness to them and try and bring them to the light too, you know, but, but ultimately it's the most high that calls them out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Twitter for your words, uh, Zakane. Twitter for your words. All praise to the most high. And 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 <laughs> man, praise y'all. Uh it actually, I now know why uh, you know, like they call Jeremiah the weeping prophet, because as you said, uh Zakane, the most high shook us and he woke us up and he's given us the ability to see. And as we start to see, and it comes more and more clear to us. It gets sad, you know what I'm saying, when you think about those who are still rejecting and refuse to embrace and just still don't want to accept the truth. And I understood why Jeremiah cried, because the same way we just read about Canaan, like these prophets knew what Yah was going to do if the people didn't get right. And he knew it was going to befall those who didn't get right. And I mean, that's where we are now. We should have the wisdom of knowing that First of all, first and foremost, for us and our families, like and when I say us and our family, I mean us and our children, like our household. We have to make sure that we are right and trying to make sure our election is sure. But while we're trying to do our best, just looking at how far away others are, like it is so sad. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's almost like it makes you want to cry. You know what I'm saying? It really does make you want to cry. And that's why Jeremiah cried. Like he, you know, you don't want to see the destruction of your people. Like you love your people. You don't, you don't want to see that. But knowing that if, if they don't get right with the most high, you know, and, 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 and the same way he shook us, the reality, that it, the reality of it is he shook some of them. It's just rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. I mean, re, uh, rebellion is as, is as witchcraft. And as you said, uh, Zakane, they're under that spirit of witchcraft and, and they're in that trance and stubbornness as idolatry. They're just too stubborn to let go of that way. So, man, praise y'all that he's put us on the path and may he let us endure on the path. So hallelujah, hallelujah. Totally y'all for Mishmakov, like-minded brothers and sisters that we can all uh, dwell together and at least have someone to fellowship with. So praise be to the most high, praise be to the most high. Hallelujah. All right, before we close, uh, Mishmakov, does any of the, uh, all the elders have already spoken, uh, the imams said their piece. Um, any other imams had any words? If not, we're gonna open it to the floor. Um, if anybody has anything they want to share uh, before we get ready to close out. All right, Kadak, out the floor is yours, Adon. Uh, I just want to read this scripture real quick in terms of idolatry. Okay, come on, with it, sir. Uh, this is Wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha, verse 14, uh, four, chapter 14, verse 27. And it says, for the worshiping of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. Hallelujah. Praise y'all for that, Adon. Will you read that one more time? Call it off and read that again for everybody to hear it. Praise be to the most high, y'all. Wisdom of Solomon in the Apocrypha 14, verse 27. For the worshiping of idols not to be named is the beginning, the cause, and the end of all evil. Mm, 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 mm. Hallelujah. So this is where it starts. Idolatry is where it starts. That's where all evil is birthed. So it's birthed. So uh, Toda, Toda for the Ruach that he placed upon you to share that with us, Adon, and for you even speaking up, because y'all know Kanak, y'all's normally quiet, but when he has something to say, it's going to be powerful. So all praise, honor, esteem me to the most high. Thank you, Adon. Uh, Shah Shamar, the floor is yours. So can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, you know, uh, total blessing, you know, um, definitely, you know, it, you know, <sighs> gave me insight, you know, some things I've been thinking about, because one thing I was thinking about, you know, when you first get in a walk, you know, you have some things you have to overcome. And then, you know, after you, let's say you're in the walk for a year or a year and a half or so, you know, you have new things that, new problems that arise. And let's say if those problems would have came to me when I was first in a walk, you know, I don't know how I would have handled them. But now since I'm in a walk, I would say, the problems and the things, you know, that I'm up against are more complex now. Being that now, since I know how the most high works and I know a little bit of the word now, you know, I have 
strength and I have more tools and, you know, I have more knowledge to fight those things. So, you know, that's something I wanted to share. And also, um, uh, I had a poem that I wanted to share. And, you know, I believe it's, you know, it's been on my heart. I just think I should share it because one thing I heard today was um, being asleep. And that's one thing that I mentioned in my poem. So, you know, if we have time, I definitely want to share it. Go ahead, Aki, you got the floor. Boy's yours. Okay. Can, okay. Yahuwah is life. Yahuwah is full of love. Yahuwah's words are true. Yahuwah's mercy endures forever. Yahuwah is righteous in all his ways. There are people in the world who are asleep. There are many people who do not know Yah's words or understand him. I was once one of those people until one day I was in my dining room and Yah opened my eyes and showed me who he was and who I was and I began to understand his sweet words. I was awakened from my sleep and I was glad, but I also cried because I was sad and frustrated because I spent years living in error. I believe that the father created the heavens and the earth, but I didn't fully understand his character. I was overzealous in my past life and I had a strong lustful desire for the ways of the world. There were times where I had confidence in my own power and I had confidence in my own flesh. However, I would feel down and my heart was heavy and my confidence would fail. In the past, I didn't know that Yah was my confidence, but now I know that Yah is my confidence, that he is my source of my strength. When I'm weak, Yah is strong. When I trust in Yah, there's everlasting strength. There is no one like Yah. I repeat, there is no one like Yah. Yah is faithful and he cannot lie because all his words are true. Man may deceive me and let me down, but Yah is strong in his righteousness and he is righteous in all his ways. Although I have slipped numerous times, I will strive to be perfect. Please give me the strength, Yah, to stay on the path to righteousness. Now that I am awake from sleep, I must seek Yah daily so I will not daydream. Yah, please keep me far from sin. Keep my heart clean. Have mercy on me. And please not remember my sins and blot out the sins of my youth. Teach me, Yah, how to hear your voice. Teach me, Yah, how to teach your word. Let your, your, let your light shine through me. Bless me, Yah, with strength, health, a willing mind, and an upright heart so that I can serve you. Thank you, Yahuwah, total by Yahuwah, for loving me and saving me. 25 years in this captivity, and you have been faithful to me. Sometimes I drift off into deep thoughts, and I think of the good things that I have received in this life thus far. How are you? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Strong poem, Adon. Strong spoken word. Strong spoken word always from you, Aki. Uh, keep pouring your heart out on the paper and keep sharing it, Aki. Keep sharing it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, Aharon, the floor is yours, Aki. Aaron, Aharon, the floor is yours. You, you're still muted if you're speaking out. You're still muted, Aki. All right, maybe he's not. Can, can y'all hear me? John, Maury, we got you loud and clear. All right, just want to make sure you can hear me. Go on one more time. Aaron, the floor is yours. Aaron, the floor is yours. Your mic is muted. All right. If you hear me, you still came at your statement. You might have to log out and come back in if you froze up. Uh, you hear me, y'all? The floor is yours because we can't hear Aaron. Shalom, all right. Yeah, it was a, a great lesson. Um, I appreciate you reading over it and um, just reading over it and making the statements that you was making. Um, it had me thinking about how all of this has been connecting over the readings that we've been doing over um, 
the last couple of weeks. And um, pretty much the chapters that we read, it all came to a head. And this chapter right here, because um, it had me thinking back to when we read the chapter when the prophet, he met that king of Assyria and he was weeping because he knew what was going to happen and what he was going to do. And he was like, oh, what you talking about? And now we read this chapter and now it finally done came to a head and it then came around full circle. And um, I found it interesting how he was talking about the idolatry as well, because um, we read, I think it was last week or the week prior, about how Abraham had dealt with the idolatry that he had to deal with with his family. And you get a contrast with that, except on a larger scale with the kings, how, um, how you mentioned how the one king, how even though he lived righteous, he still didn't get rid of the high places where the idolatry was going on at. And because of that, you see how the Most High dealt with that versus how he dealt with Abraham. And I found a very interesting contrast with that because in Abraham's case, Abraham, he got up and he dealt with it himself. And over time, the Most High, when he got up, he rewarded him. But in this case, because the kings didn't deal with it at that time, when the Most High got up this time, there wasn't a reward, but there was a punishment. And that's what you see with um, us getting punished with the king of Assyria and so on and so forth because of the stuff going on for so long. So I found that to be a very interesting contrast to how what going on today, because um, I know around this time of the year, for example, um, you got all these fraternity sororities, for example, they had this day is that their um their founders day, quote unquote, where they got founded at is around this time of the year or whatever. And it's a form of idolatry for me. And it's not a it's a form of concrete idolatry, but it's more on the abstract idolatry at the same time because even though they carry that um that symbol of the Greeks or whatever with the idolatry, they got it ingrained in their minds. So it's really on a mental level of idolatry. So whenever they hear those words or whatever the name of their organization is, bam, they got this high mind trance mindset where they flash back to that and they, you know, they offer servitude to that or whatever. It's the same type of thing. So that's what it reminded me of in the forms of idolatry that our people have to deal with because they got this thing called legacy amongst their um, their whole cult thing where they try to pass that on to their kids and they get their kids on that at an early age to where they make them think, oh, I want to be a part of that. So that's a form of idolatry that I see as a parallel to what was going on in the past today. And you can see that it mentioned even in the scripture where they talk about, oh, we want to be like the Greeks or whatever. Um, and the Maccabees, it's the sort of offspring of that. But that's another story. But it, it all relates to everything or whatever. And the fact that you mentioned in the thing about the um, thing with the with the famine um, and that going on, I, it's funny that you mentioned that because I it, right before Shabbat, I was um, going to the store to get this water that I usually get and I went to buy it and the price had went up $4 on the price of the water and I usually get a 40% coupon with it every week or whatever and I noticed the price of when I said dang this water when this water been like $10 now this thing almost $15 like what in the world or whatever so um when you had said that I personally felt the um, repercussions of that personally, um, you know, across the board on how we all dealing with that. And like you mentioned, it just goes to show you how um, basically it's end game time and most high he's getting ready to stand up to address the issue, like how he did with Abraham. He rewarded him in that issue instance because he had got sick and tired of the idolatry. He rewarded him in that instance in the past, with the kings, he got up and he punished because they didn't deal with it. And now that same thing about to happen again. He about to get up again and he about to deal with the same issue. 
And it don't look like it's going to be in an instance of Abraham. It's going to be in the instance of how he dealt with the kings of Israel in the past. So um, great lesson to how you brought all of that to light. And I'll pray for the most high for, you know, um, basically showing us um, and ringing the alarm, so to speak, for those that are um, watching, like the scripture said, those that watching in the end times or whatever, all praises that um, he blessed with spirits do that. And um, hopefully, as we move forward, we continue to have that spirit and we continue to build forth the according to his will. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah. Total for your words, Adon. Total for your words. And uh, you brought a lot of points out. Uh, and like I said, that is one that we do have to speak on, uh, too. I'm glad you brought it up. The fraternities and that pledging that they do that is uh, laden in idolatry. And what saddens me, even with those things, is you know, I have friends that have looked at me as being the strange one because I, you know, I'm dedicated to this. And like you said, they are really dedicated that they, they gather regularly for those, those appointments. And just the stuff that they do is wicked, you know, but still they pledge. So uh, told off for bringing that point out to associate it with modern times because that's something that we can actually speak to the Yaladim or the children about because that's something that they try to make cool in college when it's actually not so cool. So uh, told off, told off for your words, I think. All right, Aaron, uh, floor is yours, Aki. Shalom, shalom. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. I appreciate that. Uh, I just want to say uh, all praise to the most high. Uh, this was a total blessing. And um, it was a very great lesson in terms of speaking on idolatry and um, the present time. Uh, a lot of people in this walk, they want Yah in their life, but uh, they always want him to do something first before they uh, follow him or accept him into their life. And... Um, they want things to be more comfortable before they actually uh, let him in. And uh, some people don't want to surrender control unto him. And um, a lot of things that I've been uh, practicing and studying is uh, more elevation and uh, becoming much more confident and um, allowing God to control and take uh, the wheel of my life. And um, I just want to say all praise to the Most High for uh, everybody in here. And um, may Yah elevate everyone as you as well, Moray. Appreciate you for bringing out this uh, beautiful lesson. It's very rich and um, deep as well too. And um, it's very much needed. And uh, yeah, may y'all uh, Baruch you and your, your, your household. How are you? Hallelujah, hallelujah. All praise and honor and esteem be to the most high. May he continue to elevate you, Adon. And uh, your words were, uh, were well received, well spoken. Um, uh, in reference to uh, people want to be comfortable first. And like you said, we just got to yield and submit to the most high. And that's what we all have to learn to do. There are people trying to get in position or like you say, want these comforts, but the comfort comes once you submit to Yah. So uh, total for, the, for your words. And that's what a lot of us have to learn to do. Even some that's already been awakened need to learn how to submit more to Yah than, than self. And what you said kind of ties in with Shah's poem when Shah said there was times when he tried to do things of his own strength, but he understands uh, and uh, gave, gave, uh, gave thought that his own power, he was doing something, but we almost learned to submit to the power of the most high. And that's when we will truly be elevated. So total for your words, total for your words, Aki, and blessing to you and your household and to the little one. All praise to the most high, praise the most high. All right, Mishpacha, we're gonna give all praise, honor and esteem to the most high, Yah. Uh, Barak is Kodash name. Um, Todaya for allowing us to fellowship on your Shabbat. Um, <clears throat> at this time, I'm going to ask Captain Yohanan, so if you could, if you could do the closing Tefla. Okay, Nadon. Told mine to clear. Hallelujah. 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 We want to give all esteem, praise, shout, joy to the Elohim of Israel, the mighty one, the creator, our almighty, the creator of the heaven and earth and sea and everything went in it. The Elohim of our forefather, the Elohim of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the Elohim of Yahshua HaMashiach, our salvation, all your northern ones that gone before me. As we all stand in front in our own homes, Abba, in front of you, Abba, we first want to say, Toda Yah, for your goodness, your love, 
in your amazing grace, Abba. Toda Yah, for your Ruach, your spirit, that live and guide us, Abba. We want to say, Abba, we want to be obedient to your set apart commands, Abba. 100% obedient, Abba. Not this hell. We want to be all the way there, Abba. We know, Abba, it take work from us. It take dedication from us. And it would take that obedience from us to reach that goal, Abba. To your perfect word, Abba. Your word is perfect, Abba. And there's no denying that, Abba. We want to follow your Torah, which guide us to that goal, Abba. Every word that you pronounce, Abba, we want to follow it alone. Your righteous word, Abba. Abba, we still want you to continue building us up. Helping us, loving you. With all our love, with all our body, with our mind, and with our soul, so that we could give ourselves fully to you, Abba. Abba. Help your children on this earth. Follow in the word, the world, the world that's doing wickedness out here, Abba. That's spraying darkness out here, Abba. Not the night darkness, the evil darkness, Abba. Let us be like your anointed ones, Abba, that's walked the earth, Abba. That showed us how to be a perfect example to follow, Abba. You sent your anointed ones down, Abba, in your character, Abba. You gave them instructions, Abba, and they followed your instructions, Abba. Your prophecy is coming into play. And your children, some of your children on this earth, Abba, don't see it, Abba. Abba, we have to get away with all the idolatry, with all the paganism, Abba, with all the hatred, Abba, amongst each other, Abba. And we have to start building with each other, Abba, coming together as Abba. Like our ancestors, when they was in Egypt in bondage, when they all came together, Abba, and cried out to you, and you sent your faithful servant to, to get him out that bondage. We might not be in that bondage like in Egypt, Abba, but we're in bondage, Abba. We see what's going on, Abba. Because of our own doing, Abba. We see how your children, it continue destroy, trying to destroy your creation, Abba. But you still continue loving us, Abba. Mm. That is a love and a great Elohim, a great father, Abba, who loves his children unconditionally. You see your children with the idols. You see your children with the wickedness. You see your children doing everything that's against your word, Abba. And you still loving us, Abba. Not giving up on us, Abba. But you is punisher, Abba. And we are getting them weapons, Abba. 
and your ch your children deserve them with this album. But we are ready for that correction album. So we can get right with you, Abba. Abba told out for the Moray Abba. For putting out the lesson, Abba. As Moray Shemai have a lot of things going on with his Miss Bakai, with his Abba, Abba. And he's still standing strong. And sometimes I know he's standing weak because of the, all the pressure and things he had to do for his Abba, Abba. But you continue putting your spirit into the Moray. Lifting them up to keep telling you putting out the lessons, the studies, Abba. Continue teaching the sheep, which is us, Abba, to come back to you, Abba. So we appreciate Maurice Shemak, Abba. We appreciate your servant that you put in each and one of our lives that's on this line, Abba. Because we are building strong together, Abba. We are coming together as a family album. When one of us down, we all have to lift each other up, Abba. So Abba, I'm just saying, Abba, told our Abba, told our Abba, for always being there with us, Abba, for not giving up on us, Abba. It's tough, Abba. It's tough out here, and we all dealing with a battle out here, Abba. But we have to stay strong through you, Abba. It's some days your children sometimes feel like they, like, what the heck going on, Abba? Why this has Abba? What can we do better, Abba? How can we destroy the weakness, Abba? But we have to stay strong and keep faith into you, Abba, because everything in your way, in your plan, Abba. And we know when you come to destroy this wickedness, <laughs> Israel better be ready. So, Abba, I'm praying that your children from the four corners of earth, Abba, that's seeking you, Abba, continue preparing to be ready. when that real war starts, Abba. When you come sit down and start destroying stuff around here, Abba. Here's what we want to be ready. Like my more say, whose side are you leaning on? We want to always lean on your side. So, Abba, we ask for a good night's sleep, Abba, and get ready for another lesson from the Moray in the morning, Abba. Ask for the Moray to get him rest, let him refresh, renew, Abba, so he can put out the lesson, Abba. Also, for the Zakain, as he gets ready to put out his two minute warning tomorrow, Abba. We ask for him to renew and refresh, Abba. And to all my elders, Abba, to the Yah for all the elders, Abba, to the Yah for all the brothers and sisters, Abba. We want to say all together, Abba, that we love you, we serve you, we honor you, and we esteem your set apart name. Blessed be you, Yahuwah Elohim. Blessed be the name of Yahuwah Elohim. And blessed will come in the name of Yahuwah Elohim. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Shalom. Hallelujah. 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 Amen and amen. Uh, powerful prayer, though. All praise, honor, esteem be to the Most High. Mishpaka, get you some rest. Uh, Shabbat shalom to you all. If y'all would, Please be mindful to keep Sister Valerie in your prayers as she lost her father. Um, so we know she still have a hard time. Told her, yeah, she was able to make it on with us tonight. But y'all, please keep her in prayer. And remember to keep Miss uh, Lily in prayer as well as she lost her mother. So just keep them, keep them, keep them in your prayers. 
And with that, we're going to say uh, Ahaba and Shalom, Ahaba and Shabbat Shalom. I uh, love you all, Mishpaka. Most I will. I'll see you uh, for the day portion. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.